So far, all the categorical variables that we've been including in our regression models have been binary, meaning they have just two categories. Um, but the, in this video, we're going to talk about how we can include categorical variables that have more than just two categories. So specifically, we're going to look at predicting diamond prices based on the carat, which is the unit of size, and also the color. So in our data set, there are over 2,000 diamonds, and color takes eight values from D up to K. So those are in order where the D diamonds are like clear and colorless, um, and then they go up to kind of a faint yellow for K. So one option that we could consider is just to assign each color a number. So like D is one, E is two, up to K is eight, um, and then just treating color as a quantitative variable. So that is an option, but we would be making a pretty big assumption in doing that. So if we were to treat it as quantitative, we'd be assuming that the distance between each category is equal, right? So in other words, the distance between D and E uh, would be the same as the distance between E and F. So we'd be assuming that the distance between each category is equal. And sort of related to that, let's think about how we define linear, like a linear relationship. So in a linear model, a one unit increase in X has a certain predicted change in Y no matter where you are on the x-axis. So not only are we assuming that the distance between each category is equal, um, but we'd also be assuming that the change in price is the same for each one unit increase in color. Change in price is equal for each, I'm gonna put one unit because this is kind of a unit we've made up, for each one unit change in color. So that may or may not be a reasonable assumption. So let's say that instead we want to treat color as a categorical variable. How could we do that using indicators? So we're going to need more than one of these because indicators are just 0 and 1, so that only allows you to distinguish between two different categories. So the way we're going to do this is that each color is going to have its own indicator. So like for the D indicator, it's going to be 1 if the color is D, and then 0 for everything else. So you're basically using this variable just to determine like color D or not color D. Um, and then we can do the same thing for E. So this E indicator variable would be 1 if the color was E and 0 for everything else. And we could keep going. Um, we've got eight different colors here. Um, so we could keep going until we go up to K. So one if K, zero else. But actually it turns out that this is a little bit redundant because if you have um, D all the way up through J and they're all zero, you know that it's not color D, not color E, and so on up to J, then the only option left is that it must be color K. So we don't actually need this last indicator because if all of the other indicators are zero, then that's just going to be the way we mark category K, right? In other words, K is kind of like our baseline group, and then all of the other indicators are looking at the difference between K and that other color. So it turns out the number of indicators that we need is always going to be equal to the number of categories minus one. So number of indicators is equal to the number of categories minus one. And this may look familiar because this is basically degrees of freedom, right? If you've got all of the others defined, you can figure out the last one. Um, you don't need that last indicator. So the output that I have here is for a model that only has color as a predictor of price. So I'm not taking into account size yet. This isn't even really um, multiple regression because color is the only variable that I'm looking at. So let's think about how to interpret the intercept and the slopes here. So we'll start off with the intercept. So remember the intercept is the predicted y when all of your explanatory variables are equal to zero. But in this case, when all of our explanatory variables are equal to zero, then that means that we're talking about color K. So to interpret the intercept, this would just be the predicted price for a diamond of color K. 
So this is our most yellow colored diamond. Diamond of color K is this amount, $4,147. So not looking at size yet, basically just like the average price for a color K diamond. And then what about the slope for the color D? So usually we think of the slope as the predicted change in Y for a one unit change in X. So what does it mean to have a one unit change in X here? A one unit change goes from zero to one. So basically we're going from our baseline group, which is K, up to one, which is the color D. So we wanna know how much does the price change or how much is it predicted to change as we go from D to K. So we could interpret that and say that the predicted price for a diamond of color D, it's a weird way to phrase the color thing, maybe there's a better way to do that. Um, but the predicted price for a diamond of color D is, let's see, $876 and it's negative, so $876 lower than a diamond of color K. So this is actually kind of surprising, right? This is saying that we expect the D diamond to be a lower price than a K diamond. But remember we said D was the clear one. So that's what you kind of think of wanting like in jewelry, not like the more yellowy color. Um, so it's actually pretty weird um, that the price is gonna be cheaper for these nice clear um, diamonds. So we'll talk about later why that might be. Also notice that I have two different tests here. So I have the effect test, which is um, an F ratio um, for the color, and then I have the T ratios for um, D through J. So what is the difference in these? What is the purpose of the F test versus the purpose of the T test? So go ahead and pause the video, think about that for a second. What do you think is the difference between the F test and the T test here? So what makes an F test different from a T test is that F tests are able to test multiple parameters at once. And we can see that here. If we look at the table, the degrees of freedom is seven. So this is testing all of our indicators at once. There's um, eight categories, eight minus one is seven indicators. And the F test is looking all of those at the same time. So basically are any of the colors different from each other? So for the null hypothesis, if we wanted to write it in terms of an association, we could just say that color is not associated with the price. Um, another way of saying this is just that the means are all the same, right? We could say that the mean for color D is equal to E is equal to F up to K. So here we're testing all of those indicators at once, all the indicators related to color. So the F statistic there is 26.7853, and this has a very small p-value, so less than 0 .0001. And so this means that we have very strong evidence of an association. Very strong evidence of an association between color and price. Um, in other words, we have very strong evidence that at least one of the colors is different from the others in terms of price. So just based on this F test, um, we don't know which of the colors are different from each other. Uh, we also don't know how big that difference is, right? Because sometimes things can be statistically significant, even if the effect size is actually pretty small. So um, we don't know how big it is or which groups are different, just that color is associated with the price. So then what about these T tests? The T tests are for the individual predictor. So you can sort of think, go back to what slope for D meant. It was the difference in price between a color D diamond and a K diamond. So basically we're comparing each group to the baseline and deciding whether that difference is significant. So the null hypothesis for this would be no difference between the color, whichever color you're testing, no difference between an individual color and K. So this isn't testing everything all at once, this is just looking at one individual color. So let's go ahead and do the one with D since we've already talked about it. Um, so the T statistic for D is negative 
and the p-value is fairly small, 0 0.0007. And so this is going to give us strong evidence that that difference between them is real, right? Strong evidence that colors D and K do not have the same mean price. So this is interesting thinking about the colors, right? We said it was kind of surprising that the D diamonds cost less than the K diamonds, and this p-value would indicate that it's not just a fluke, right? It's not just that um, by chance the D diamonds ended up being a little bit less expensive in the sample. It seems like there is a real difference in means here that the color D diamonds really do tend to be cheaper, but maybe that significant association is actually coming up because of a confounding variable. If that's the case, then we could use multiple regression to control for that variable. So notice how this model is different. Now, besides all of our color indicators, um, we also have carat size as part of our model. So let's think about how this could work. So we were interested originally in the relationship between color and price. But maybe size is acting as a confounder here. So remember, for it to be a confounder, it has to be associated with both the explanatory and the response variable. Um, so let's start off with the response. I think this one is probably pretty obvious that these would be associated, right? We would expect that um, bigger diamonds would cost more on average, right? So there's got to be an association between um, the size and the price. But size and color, that one is a little bit less obvious. So what kind of relationship between size and color would explain the values that we've already seen? So we've seen that D diamonds tend to be cheaper than K diamonds, right? That the clear diamonds that you would expect to be more expensive are actually cheaper. So how could that be if we think about the size? Maybe the reason that those clear diamonds are cheaper is that they also tend to be smaller, right? Maybe colorless diamonds are smaller on average. So if that were the case, then that could explain the relationship that we've seen. That could explain why the D diamonds are cheaper on average when we ignored size. So let's explore this in the graph builder and see what it looks like. So I'm going to put price on the y-axis and I'm going to break it down by color. And since this is a quantitative variable, maybe I'll do um, some parallel box plots to kind of look at the relationship there. So this is confirming what we saw, right, that these um, clear diamonds do tend to cost less, right? The median prices for those are cheaper than for the um, more yellow diamonds. Also, this confirms our decision not to use a linear model, right, because we don't see a steady increase in the prices as we go from D to K. Instead, it seems like we've kind of got D, E, and F that are all sort of low, um, and then G through K that are higher. So we definitely want to treat those as different groups, not one quantitative scale. Now let's try breaking it down by size and see how that changes things. So I'm going to put size up here where it says group X. And size is a quantitative variable, but it's going to break it into categories just to kind of make this easier to see. Okay, so what's going on here? We've got a lot of box plots to look at. Um, but basically, if you look at the general trend as we go from low size up to larger diamonds, the prices are increasing, right? So that's no surprise that size tends to be um, associated with higher prices. But let's look at the relationship between color and price after adjusting for size. So remember, adjusting for size means that you look at the different sizes separately. So if we look within the sizes, so like these diamonds are all about the same size, within that size category, we can see that the prices do tend to go down, right? That D, the clear ones, are more expensive, and the prices go down as you head toward K. And the same thing in these other size categories. Um, a little bit less clear up here in the top one, but it does seem to be that there's a trend where after adjusting for size, you do see that the clear diamonds cost more than the yellow diamonds. So the graph confirms um, that colorless diamonds, the ones D, E, F, those categories, um, colorless diamonds do tend to cost more, but only after adjusting for size. So that means after we have um, size in the model. 
So looking at the output for our multiple regression model, um, we can see that this is confirmed because now when we look at um, color D, it does have a positive slope. And so that means that our predicted price for D is higher than K after we've adjusted for the size. And the rest of the interpretations are going to be pretty familiar here um, because this is really just an additive model, right? This is a model that has two different explanatory variables, size and color, um, and it has no interaction terms right now. So we can interpret this in ways that are very similar to what we did with additive models before. And later on, I'll give you a chance to practice that on your own.